Making Connections, Dropout Prevention in Rural Schools is provided by Regional Educational Laboratory Midwest through funds provided by the Institute of Education Sciences. Hello, my name is Jenny Scala. Thank you for joining me today. I'm a senior researcher at the American Institutes for Research where I've done a lot of work focused on dropout prevention in rural areas. Today, our panelists are going to discuss trends seen across the country related to rural dropout prevention and also share recent research looking at promising practices that support dropout prevention in the rural communities. They also will take a closer look at dropout prevention efforts in rural school districts in Indiana, describing how one district in particular has responded to low graduation rates. Our panelists today are Dr. John Hill, the Executive Director of the National Rural Education Association and a member of the Rel Midwest Rural Research Alliance, Dr. Terry Sargent, the Superintendent of Jennings County Schools here in Indiana, and Dr. Caitlin Howley, a fellow at ICF International located in West Virginia. First of all, thank you all very much for joining me. It's great thank to see you here today. Our first question, what are the unique challenges that rural school districts across the country face in regard to dropout prevention? Dr. Hill? Well, if we were to fly across the United States at 50,000 feet, we would see two big issues out there. One is capacity, and the other is the community context. In terms of capacity, we have declining enrollments in most rural school districts, and declining enrollments results in less funding for those particular schools, and so that creates issues. Then there's the, the capacity of, of class offerings. As schools become smaller, especially at the secondary level, it's really hard to offer some of the classes because very few students are there to take the classes. And then there's the, the whole thing of, of the capacity of the teachers to teach. For example, at the secondary level, a science teacher may teach all the science disciplines in a small rural district rather than just biology or just chemistry and physics. And then there's the capacity of the workforce itself. All, all districts, uh, rural, urban, suburban, are struggling to find math, science teachers, special needs teachers. But particularly in rural areas, we struggle finding with family and consumer science teachers, vocational agriculture teachers, project lead the way teachers. And those are subject areas that really engage students. And so the decrease in funding then creates issues with student services. Administrators have to make choices between number of teachers, number of counselors, social workers, uh, what kind of alternative school programs are you going to offer, sometimes even down to which career tech classes are you going to offer or extracurricular activities. All those kinds of things connect students to the schools. And then the community context themselves in many of our small rural communities, many of, of those who live there have not attended college or post-secondary, have no post-secondary education of any kind. And the culture itself, most of these communities are very close-knit, which is a good thing, but uh, there's a safety net there if you're in a community and everybody knows you and you know them. And then there's that, that desire that you, you like to keep people close to home. Also in our rural communities, there's a high poverty level. And um, we've lost a lot of high paying jobs, particularly in manufacturing in small communities and in the ag industry. So those are those two big issues that are hanging around out there. Great. 
And Dr. Howley, how does your research on rural schools relate to the trends that Dr. Hill just mentioned? Our work uh, really tends to reaffirm um, the issues that Dr. Hill uh, mentioned um, in some of our work in Kentucky and Tennessee and West Virginia, for example. Uh, we see the continuing effect of the, re the recession on funding levels. Very few states have returned to pre-recession funding amounts. Um, combine that with the kind of conventional uh, difficulty that rural schools and districts face wherein there are fewer people and therefore what people there are have more responsibilities. It, it's some pretty Im impressive headwinds uh, in terms of dropout prevention efforts. Um, Another concern, and Dr. Hill alluded to this as well, is that there tends to be less breadth and depth in terms of high school curricular offerings, mm -hmm. math, science, foreign language, advanced topics, um, interdisciplinary kinds of um, courses, which are the things that really get kids interested and engaged. Um, so that's an issue. Uh, yet another issue is that uh, larger percentages of teachers in rural places are teaching outside of their specialty. So it means that the instruction that students receive may not be as good as it could be if it were elsewhere. And this question is actually for all three of you. So given the close-knit close -knit community that rural schools are in, are rural communities concerned that promoting graduation and college going uh, might result in a loss of young local talent? I would really characterize that as ambivalence, that rural parents and community members are ambivalent because on one hand, they see that the world is changing, that a high school diploma, a college degree is increasingly important for entry into jobs. And like any parents anywhere, they want their children to be self-sufficient and contributing members of society. On the other hand, they've observed um, that uh, rural youth tend to leave in greater numbers than return as adults to pursue uh, college or uh, career elsewhere. And so it's difficult for lots of rural community members and parents to reconcile um, their valuation of education, on the one hand, with their care and concern for their rural community's sustainability. Uh, and this kind of tension has led lots of rural observers to suggest that um, any education improvement efforts should be paired with community and economic development efforts as well. Great. Dr. Hill or Dr. Sargent, would you like to add to that? Well, we, we've been concerned with the brain drain, as we call it here in Indiana, as well. Uh, several governors have talked about that, and uh, our largest our largest community is, is only about five or six thousand people, uh, North Vernon, Indiana, um, and uh, I believe our high school does a wonderful job educating kids with a wide array of offerings and, and programs, but we, I agree with you, there's an ambivalence there. I mean, we want the best for our children, and we realize that if they really, really, we want to open up the world for them and allow them to pursue whatever they want to pursue beyond Jennings County, uh, we have to assume that many of them are not going to come home. I, I can confirm as a parent what, what the other two have said. And, and I think something that Dr. Halley has mentioned, this, this whole idea is that we have to think to the future. What are what are things that we can do with those students who are in school now that, uh, that if they desire to come back home, uh, there may be ways to get them back home. And so, you know, when I first took this job, I thought it was all about education, but the truth of the matter is, it, it is about education, it is about economic development, mm -hmm. it is about the environment, it's about healthcare, it's about technology, and failure to address one is failure to address them all. Right. Great. So I'm curious what dropout prevention challenges you've seen that are specific to Indiana's rural school districts. Dr. Hill? Well, we've seen uh, several things, and I think one thing we need to remember is that dropout prevention begins way before high school. Sometimes we just associate it with middle school or high school, and so uh, preschool programs, getting students ready for school uh, so that they, they come to school with the experiences that, that some more affluent students might have. Full day kindergarten, again, a chance to, to get students ahead of the game, 
get everybody on the same playing level. Uh, those have been successful, we, we think, in uh, internships, uh, involving students to partner with community people. And again, in rural communities, there are all kinds of resources out there just waiting to be asked to be part of, of this experience. Uh, Problem-based learning, we see that some rural schools are, have been identified as high-tech schools or schools of inquiry. And again, another way of engaging students uh, with their learning. The service learning projects, uh, uh, maybe not as popular today as they were a few years ago, but again, involving students in the community, connecting them with the community. Uh, and then the alternative schools, especially those that have a vocational component, a counseling component, and obviously an academic component. And then I think uh, the one-on-one -on -one, uh, efforts that some school districts are making, I think, lends a lot of potential to leverage technology to engage students more in school. Great. This question is for everybody. So students often show signs of struggling before dropping out. We know that dropping out is a process. It's not just a singular event. Are there any school or district processes that could be improved to better identify or support struggling students in rural communities? I think early identification is the most important thing. We've put a lot of work into identifying at-risk students uh, well down into grade school. Uh, and do put a lot of resources into those children in order to, uh, I guess, put them on track, so to speak, uh, point them in the right direction, give them all the opportunities possible to, uh, to really make the most of this opportunity called education uh, before you get to the point of no return or you get to the point where you really can't change that. Um, a lot of it has to do with transitions from one level to another. Uh, a child leaving elementary school, going into middle school, or middle school into high school. Um, those are very, very critical points in time that, um, uh, that I think we've only really appreciated in, as educators over maybe the last uh, decade or so. Uh, and I've really put a lot of emphasis into those transition periods. Uh, research shows that a high school student, um, a brand new high school student, a brand new freshman, uh, coming into high school will create their own mindset about that building and that environment within the first six weeks mm -hmm. that they're there. And that mindset will determine the next, you know, three and a half plus years uh, and their success in school. So if you do things to make that transition uh, a quality transition and help them to find success and uh, different things that they can get involved with at school that they enjoy right from the beginning in that first six weeks, the likelihood that they'll graduate goes up exponentially. Uh, that's just one example of a, of a success, successful transition, but those are the key times. And are you guys doing in Jennings County anything particular to help that elementary to middle school transition? Oh, yeah, we have a lot of interaction between our middle school and all six of our elementary schools. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, you know, tours of the building mm -hmm. and uh, uh, increased interaction between middle school and, high, uh, and, and elementary age kids. Um, we're talking, and, and we, I was just in some meetings that we had last week talking about uh, specific projects where we would send middle school students into the, the elementary schools uh, uh, several times, particularly when kids are in the fifth and sixth grade, in an effort to get them even further oriented to middle school. Uh, so that they're, yeah, we expect them to be excited and a little nervous, but not scared to go to middle school. And probably too many of them still are in our, in our environment in any school corporation. How about for the rest of you? Are there any um policies or strategies that schools can do to help with that early identification of students who might be at risk? I think the whole idea of monitoring reading uh, is critical. Mm -hmm. Those who uh, you know, are struggling with the written language because every subject we teach, even math, is embedded in language. Mm -hmm. uh, and so being sure that uh, reading levels, reading itself is being monitored, I think is, is really critical. Um, and then as we get into the upper grades to look at reading uh, as something that all the disciplines need to be involved in, not 
just the English teacher, the language arts teacher. I think that becomes critical, but continuing, continuous monitoring of, of reading. Um, obviously, absenteeism is something that has to be monitored on a regular basis. How many days, why, those kinds of things. And then be thinking of, of interventions as, and those would vary as, as our students vary. Uh, I think that's critical. You bring up a really important point right there in terms of those um, a different and available resources. So how can schools in rural communities find and utilize wraparound services for students that may not be available in their immediate community given the ruralness in their community? Any ideas or examples? That's a really excellent question and so important particularly in impoverished rural communities. Um, in Appalachia, one of the things that um, our families struggle with is distance. Uh, and transportation often limits access to those services. So placing them in schools is a really important strategy for overcoming that particular barrier. Um, I might suggest doing a, uh, um, a needs assessment and resource survey wherein you uh, determine who all of the regional service providers are and then contact them to find out what they offer, if they have any um, uh, services that they offer by traveling to sites and then um, finding ways using that information to coordinate services so that kids at least have some access to those services that aren't local. Great. move on and talk a little bit more locally here in Indiana. So Dr. Sargent, could you please describe your district and challenges that you've faced with student dropouts? They mostly focus in three areas. Um, one area is orientation. When I talk about preventing dropouts, I talk about making certain that it's not something you're stopping, it's something that you're forcing children or trying to orient children to look beyond receiving a high school diploma. If there's a goal out there that they want to be a particular uh, occupation, they want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a oceanographer or whatever it is that they choose to be, um, that's where you focus from the earliest time that you can pull their attention and get them to look at those things. And in their near, before they get into studying in that career that they dream about, you make them realize that to be able to make that happen, they have to graduate from high school. Um, and uh, so it's mostly a matter of orientation. Many of our families, uh, good families, been there for generations. They contribute to the community, they work hard, but very few people in that family have ever gone on to post-secondary education. Um, and uh, every year, and I hand out diplomas, they come across the stage, and I talk to many of those families on graduation day, and many of them still tell me that this child is going to go to IU or Purdue or Ball State next year, uh, and they, that, that will be the first child in their family to ever go to college. Um, and so because of this lack of orientation to a college or a post-secondary environment within the family, it's not talked about within the family as the child is growing up. We're the ones that have to introduce that into the mind of the child and make them think beyond high school. The other part John alluded to earlier is poverty. Um, we have a very high level of poverty in, in Jennings County. We, we gauge it in the schools mostly by the rate of, of free and reduced lunch. And our district-wide is 61%. I have one building that's 87 percent. Um, and uh, people who are in poverty don't tend to think about establishing college funds. They don't tend to think about more than beyond paycheck to paycheck and how do we get by and how do we keep clothes on the kids so they can go to school and look decent, those kinds of things. They, they really, there's not a lot of financial planning that goes on and so they don't really think much beyond the immediate future, uh, let alone graduating from high school and going on and doing other things. Um, the last one is homelessness. Uh, we have uh, uh, over 10 percent of our population in Jennings County, according to the federal definition, McKinney-Vento, 
uh, definition of homelessness, over 10 percent of our folks are, uh, are defined as homeless. When you have that level of your population, it's kind of like the poverty that I was alluding to a minute ago. Uh, you're thinking about survival. You may be living in a car. You may be living 10 people in a house with grandma. You know, I mean, you may be living under some, some pretty, pretty uh, stressful, dysfunctional in situations and environments. And, uh, you know, you don't think about homework in those environments, let alone, you know, finishing high school. So as we learn more about Jennings County, do you mind taking a few moments and just helping paint the picture of some of the, de the demographics within your school district? How many students do you have? Sure. Um, just so that we all have a better just understanding. Just a general. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's primarily rural. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, uh, we have one significant town, and that is North Vernon, a town of about 6,000 people, and several little villages around the county. I think the, the current population of the county might be uh, about 27,000, I believe. Um, we are, uh, our student population, we are one school district. Uh, in, the, in the entire corporation, one public school district, uh, one very small Christian academy, uh, and a fairly significant Catholic school that is grades um, uh, K through eight. Um, uh, but we're the biggest game in town, and um, we have a student population of about 4,300 kids, uh, one high school, one large middle school, and six elementary schools. Uh, there's one elementary in town, the other elementaries are all scattered throughout, throughout the county. Uh, about 500 staff members all together, a little over 300 teachers. So given the demographics that you shared in terms of homelessness as well as poverty, and as well as this notion in terms of a lot of your students are their first students um, that are going to be pursuing uh, mm -hmm. post-secondary um, goals and aspirations in education. So how has your district responded to these challenges? Well, I think we've focused in several areas. I want to give a lot of credit to uh, the, the vision and the hard work of the people, at particular, particularly in our middle school and high school, but really uh, all grades all the way up. Uh, in more recent years, it's been the, the efforts by the staff and the administration at Jennings County High School that has done a lot of that. Our former high school principal, Tim Taylor, who is now the, the uh, superintendent at Jackson Dell Schools in Osgood, Indiana, had a lot to do with that. And uh, the people who are in administration there now are just continuing with the momentum that Tim started. Again, I think part of it goes back to the transitions that we talked about a little bit ago, making sure that that transition into middle school and high school are, are successful ones for those students. Um, another area is a focus on the part of all teachers, kindergarten all the way up, talk, getting students to talk actively and frequently about what are you going to do when you grow up, uh, where are you going to, what are you going to do after you graduate from high school, um, where are you going to, where do you might maybe want to go to college or uh, anything like that. Get them to thinking in that terms. They're going to change their minds 50 times. Uh, between you know today and when they graduate from high school but that's not the idea the idea is to get them to think about it and we our teachers are are very very actively involved in doing that with all of their kids very frequently um, we have a very strong credit recovery program in the high school um, uh, that's computer based uh, that's fully staffed um, it is for students who have not been successful at certain courses, have fallen behind in their credits. We put them in the credit recovery lab to catch them up on credits so that they can hopefully graduate with their original classmates. Uh, a lot of schools do this. We do it very aggressively and have for uh, over a decade now. Um, we have gotten very involved in uh, getting kids involved in experiences where they can be on a college campus. This past year we, we took all of our sixth graders from all six elementary schools to uh, a day on campus at Indiana University. Uh, next year we are going to take all of our sophomores for a day on campus at Purdue University. Uh, and uh, we're just going to try to grow those kinds of experiences and get them not to go to IU or Purdue necessarily, but to get them to think about this environment, make it fun. 
Uh, IU and Purdue have been wonderful. They roll out the red or the gold carpet, whichever it may be, <laughs> and they, uh, uh, they really, really treat our kids wonderfully, and they just come home uh, two feet off the ground. They love the experience, and I know it's made a difference in some of those kids about you know finishing school and doing something afterwards. Um, we make strong use of career fairs and what are called reality stores. We do a huge reality store uh, as part of our curriculum in the middle school. Um, and uh, I don't know how many, how, if what you're- What is a reality what is, store? <laughs> a reality <laughs> store is where you use the resources of the entire community. Realtors, bankers, car dealers, uh, you know, uh, you know guy, the guy that runs the Walmart. Mm -hmm. uh, just everybody from, as br uh, the uh, undertakers. Uh, every profession that you can think of comes in and uh, they create a, an environment where kids have to make some, some uh, imaginary real life decisions. You know, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I want to, uh, I think they start with what do you want to have? What kind of a lifestyle do you want to have when you grow up? Okay, if you are going to have that kind of a lifestyle, you have to make, you're going to have to make this kind of an income. What does it take to make that kind of an income? Okay, you're going to have to go to college. What would you want to be if you went to college? And they just, you know, cutting to the chase, they create this entire environment they have to go through. They buy a home from a realtor. They invest their money in a bank with, the, with a real banker. Mm -hmm. uh, they do all these things, and it's a real eye-opener for sure. many of these kids that, you know, I'm not just going to have this $200,000 home and a Corvette in the garage. Uh, it's, this is what it's going to take to get there. And it gets the wheels turning as to what they're going to need to do to, to, to see their dreams come true. Um, vocational opportunities. Not everybody's cut out to go to a four-year college or maybe even a two-year college. Uh, we participate in the Southeastern Career Center at Versailles, Indiana. We are the biggest school in the Career Center that's, that takes in children from, I believe it's 12 different high schools in Southeast Indiana. Uh, we send over 200 children a day. To the, to the Southeastern Career Center. And they do a wonderful job uh, ex you know, getting kids involved in real world programs. Uh, it's not the old Volk schools that you might have seen 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, all of the career centers in the state of Indiana do a wonderful job of training kids for jobs that they can go out and they can do now and make a nice living and support it themselves and maybe a family. Uh, and many of our kids see that, and we point a lot of kids in that direction. Lastly, and, and this is the one that I think we put the most amount of emphasis on, and all of these hopefully keep kids involved in school to, to the point where we eliminate attendance issues with a lot of kids. But to me, the most important one, one of the most important ones, is, is getting kids involved in school beyond the classroom extracurricular activities. I'm not talking about everybody playing football. I'm talking about athletics, uh, drama, uh, various different clubs and organizations, uh, you know, the show choir, uh, just whatever it may be, getting everybody involved in some kind of an activity. If you have a student that is involved, say, on the wrestling team, mm -hmm. and he's a C or a D student at best, he's maybe an at-risk at student, maybe from a, a family that's facing a lot of challenges and whatever, you, there's some question as to whether or not he's going to graduate from high school. If you get him involved in wrestling, he will work hard with wrestling, he will fall in love with the team and the coach, he will work hard in the classroom to stay eligible for wrestling, the thing that he loves more than anything in the world, and inadvertently he will accidentally graduate from high school. It works throughout all extracurricular activities. That's why schools are so involved in extracurricular activities, because it gives many children an anchor in the building that they eventually, they see it through four years and they graduate and then they can go on and do, a, it makes them, it, makes, it puts them in a position that they can go on and do other things, where without that diploma, 
they, that, that's where it stops. So then for the extracurriculars, are the eligibility requirements the same regardless of what student or what extracurricular a student is in, involved Pretty in? much. Some of the non-athletic uh, organizations set their own, mm -hmm. but what I have found is that most of those uh, are a little tougher than athletics okay. and so uh, like National Honor Society and yep. you know some of those organizations their bar is pretty high uh, and uh, but uh, yeah it's just like I said it's that anchor in the building. That's great. Yeah. So there's clearly a lot going on in Jenning County. Um, Dr. Hill, some of Terry's strategies sound similar to the strengths that you mentioned earlier in the program. Um, are you aware of other rural districts in Indiana also employing these similar tactics? Well, I, I was just looking at some dropout rates uh, back in 2006, 2007, the state dropout rate was 11.5% and, and in 2013, 14, the reported rate is 4.59%. Is it tells me that a lot of people, what, you're a little lower than that, I think. 4%. Which tells me that a lot of, of districts around the state, urban, suburban, rural, are, are all employing a lot of these techniques in their particular buildings. Um, I think that uh, probably the thing that I see that, that Terry hasn't mentioned is that in a couple of the rural schools that have a high minority population, there are real efforts made again to encourage uh, the minority students to participate in the dances, to participate mm -hmm. in the extracurricular mm -hmm. events, to really make them feel part of the local community but to also interest members of the local community in their culture. And I think that serves some districts pretty well. Great. Um, are there been other results in terms of your efforts there in Jennings County? I know you quickly gave the, the, the dropout rate is now down to 4%. What was it previously, if you could paint that picture the, for us a little the bit? The previous dropout rate, if you go back to 09-10, was 80, oh, let's see here, uh, that's the graduation rate, 10.9% in the 09-10 school year and uh, most recently it was 4.1 percent. Great. So what advice would you give to other rural communities working to support dropout efforts? I would really tell them to uh, take it to heart and personalize it and really focus on every child. That's hard. That is, that's a real challenge. We are a very large rural district. I have been a superintendent and a high school principal in much smaller districts where honestly the kind of things that I'm talking about are, for lack of a better word to use, easier. Mm -hmm. Uh, than in a school where you graduate 350 kids a year like we do. But you still have to personalize it and focus on the needs of, of every child. You have to make a deliberate and aggressive effort to make sure that nobody falls through the cracks. If you don't have that in mind on the part of the school leadership and on the part of the teachers, it won't, it won't work so well. That's what you have to internalize. And then what has been the reaction from your community given the results that you just shared in Jennings County? With the increased graduation rate and decreased All of the dropout. feedback that I have received has been pride, um, you know, that we, um, we have a great school system. Uh, I hear that from the media. I hear that from uh, parents that speak to me and come up and talk to me. Uh, we have a, a, a core planning team, which is part of our long-range strategic planning effort, and it's a very broad, uh, diverse group of about 25 people. Uh, that meet several times a year and they are my ears and eyes in the community uh, outside the school board and uh, I hear lots of positive from them in terms of what we are doing and the results of what we're doing and uh, it's very encouraging uh, overall. And when you first started those uh, reality uh, days and the reality fairs, right. what was the community's reaction to getting involved in something that's, that's a little different in terms of how communities are engaging with schools? Um, I, actually, the very first time we ever had a reality store at Jennings County Middle School, it took place at the old North Vernon Junior High School many years ago when I was a teacher there. And um, I think that the rea I remember the reaction being on the part of the parents was, this is wonderful. Now they'll get to see what, real, what it's really like to try to survive out there mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and really it, bring it down to earth for them so they start thinking about uh, serious adult things in their future. And how did that translate for students from your perspective? I, I think it really, it made them a little bit more mature. It, it really has given them a little bit more direction. 
so that they, you know, again, for, with kids, kids are kids, mm -hmm. and it's, they could change their mind tomorrow, and everything is kind of general, but uh, you've got them thinking about it. You've got them thinking about graduation and post high school. Um, we're going to move on to our next topic. Um, in general, what are some of the most promising practices to help rural students graduate high school? Perhaps Dr. Halley or Dr. Hill, you could start us off. One of the things I see out there are collaboratives, and it, it would be similar to uh, an education service center, except they encompass a large number of districts, community colleges, service centers, universities. Um, and a couple examples would be the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative, which is over in southeast Ohio. Um, and again, they think about ways of working together that, that they didn't in, in their previous lifetime. Uh, they work together on professional development, but on the alternative school, uh, credit recovery classes, those kinds of things, things that individually they were so small that they could not offer together as a large collaborative, they can. The other is called the Eastern Washington Rural Alliance. That's 56 school districts, three community, or six community colleges, three universities, and I think two or three service centers. Again, cooperating in a way. And, and some of those uh, small school districts have adopted the exact same calendar. Their high schools and middle schools have adopted the exact same schedule, so a teacher in one building can teach a class at eight o'clock, students in another building can take that class at the very same time. But again, all the professional development, all the, the wraparound services together as a collaborative, they can offer those services to students where individually it would be difficult to do that. The whole thing with credit recovery classes, that's, again, that's not new, mm -hmm. but there's, it's a, a really powerful incentive for students to graduate with their, their cohort. Um, we see a lot of communities around the country leveraging local resources in rural areas. Uh, National Rural Education Association has a Rural Teacher of the Year, and mm -hmm. this year he's from uh, Oliva Strum, Wisconsin, and he's created a student-run manufacturing company. Uh, and Craig has worked with the, the, the companies in that particular community, and they've created the Ten Commandments of the Workplace. Mm -hmm. And so the focus of everything they do their freshman and sophomore year is everybody becomes proficient in the Ten Commandments of the workplace. And those kids, when you talk to the kids, they know that if you can do the Ten Commandments, you can do anything you want to do in your lifetime. But one of the secrets is, is, is all the resources that Craig has pulled in from the different small manufacturing firms. And so the very building that this, this uh, operation takes place in was built by the students uh, and they they do a lot of projects for the community and for the school itself um, the high-tech uh, schools where they have uh, projects and they invite people from the community to, to come in and serve as panels to review the student projects that's a powerful tool again it, it's kind of like uh, putting the basketball team on the court every Friday night, except this, now we're putting the, the academic performance out on the court for the community to see. And so that's been a powerful thing, again, to engage students in school. And, and, and finally, uh, as, as Terry's talked about, engaging students in ECAs. And uh, I know there was a study at one time done hollowing out the middle and how sometimes in schools we do things that kind of push students out. But it was at a presentation last spring in Pennsylvania, uh, Dr. Kai Schaff did a presentation where he's done a follow-up to this study, and one of the things he talked about, that those students that leave the community that want to come back, really want to come back, are those students that were most engaged in the school. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to recruit the students to come back to your community, look at who was involved in drama and athletics and, and all the extracurriculars because they'll be the ones that will will come back hopefully in the end so those are some things that we see out there great dr holly um, i think it's important uh, to note as we continue this conversation that uh, the data suggests that uh, rural students drop out at rates 
similar to non-rural students and that their achievement is very similar as well, often better. And that if any differences are observed, they disappear once you control for socioeconomic status. And what that means is that impoverished rural kids tend to drop out at rates similarly to uh, non-rural um, kids. Likewise, their achievement, once you control for socioeconomic status, impoverished kids from rural places tend to perform as well as non-rural kids from, uh, who are impoverished. So um, I think it's important to note that. Um, in terms of what research has suggested about promising and effective practices for uh, supporting kids to persist through school, um, a really important one is the presence of adult advocates and mentors. Um, the second is uh, academic support, things like tutoring or, as Dr. Hill mentioned, credit recovery. Um, Personalizing learning environments, I think that you alluded to this as well earlier, um, is an important uh, strategy to employ to keep kids engaged. So making instruction and curriculum meaningful rather than something routine to be memorized that doesn't connect in any way to your uh, life. Uh, increasing school and community involvement um, and parent engagement. Uh, there's evidence that that's another effective strategy. Active learning, mm -hmm. um, and I think that this connects in many ways to what you were talking about in terms of um, problem-based, project-based learning. Uh, and then finally, offering a robust career and technical education um, curriculum because, um, you know, not every kid is gonna go to college and, um, you know, there are important things to be done that don't require a college degree, but that a high school diploma and some post-secondary training would be useful for. Um, the good news is that lots of these strategies are relatively low cost and mm -hmm. require relatively little training. And so um, the unique strengths of rural communities can be leveraged pretty easily to enact some of these strategies. So for example, if you have an active school um, community relationship, well then you know some uh, interesting and engaged adults who might be willing to serve as mentors and advocates for students who are at risk. So speaking of the school community relationships, um, that's come up multiple times, I think, from each of you today during our conversations. So why are they so important, particularly in rural districts? In many rural districts, the school is the community. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's yeah. the center of the community. Yeah. And so, um, you know, you, you hear a lot of people say that, boy, when the school disappears, the community mm -hmm. disappears. And so that's it is the centerpiece, it's the center of, of social life, and so that's why it's critical. Mm -hmm. And another thing that's uh, about a school in a rural community is that it's open a lot because it is that center. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's open for other reasons, but you can then use the space for academic support like tutoring and credit recovery and other kinds of support services. Um, rural schools and their communities are also really great places for active learning. Uh, there are lots of interesting place-based uh, curriculum and uh, um, problem-based kinds of uh, projects. Uh, for example, there are great places to do environmental research, watershed monitoring, uh, local history, for example. Uh, one of my favorite examples is a project called PACERS, which I think originated in um, Alabama. And in this project, students are um, trained to use some really high-end uh, newspaper production software, and they're trained in journalism. And what often happens is in um, the rural communities um, that undertake this project, the newspaper produced by students becomes the local newspaper of record. So attaching your instruction and your curriculum to addressing real community needs or problems or strengths is a great way to keep kids plugged in. Um, I also think it's important to note that as many challenges as rural districts and schools have, they also have some pretty unique strengths. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ones that comes to mind immediately is that um, depending on region or locale, um, 
rural schools can be pretty small and so they have less bureaucracy, they are less organizationally complex, and so they're more understandable to students and change initiatives can take place more quickly. Um, again, this varies by region, but lots of rural schools have pretty low student-teacher ratios, which means that you know students receive more instructional time, more chances for one-on-one -on -one interaction with their teacher. Uh, and then finally, there's not much anonymity in rural communities and schools. So, you know, if you're slacking in school, somebody's going to notice, and that's a real benefit. Absolutely. So, Dr. Sargent, how have strong community relationships played a role in your district? Well, again, going back to something I said earlier, you know, we're the only game in town. Um, the, the high school, the Jennings County High School, is 46 years old. Uh, it was a consolidation back in the 1960s. Um, and so we have 46 years of alumni, uh, probably um, maybe half of whom still live in the Jennings County area. Uh, they may not live in Jennings County, but they live in a neighboring county and they still have strong ties to our community. Um, there's a great deal of pride uh, and there's, they pay a lot of attention to what goes on in the school corporation, good, bad, or ugly. And so we're, we're, con we're very conscious of that and we try to tap into that. And I think uh, I've had the luxury at Jennings County of having community resources at my fingertips that I didn't necessarily have in the other positions I've held uh, in my career. But because we have such tremendous support uh, and such a, an alumni base there in the community that um, um, it's been it's been great to work with and and I know not every school system rural school system has that but I think every one of them has a sense of family mm -hmm. and closeness that these folks have talked about that you don't necessarily see in a lot of urban districts so dropping out of high school can constrain students ability to move on to college are there any barriers to post-secondary school participation that are unique to rural areas there are a few I mean Largely, the barriers seem, according to the research, to be fairly similar with poverty and concerns about being able to afford a college education ranking pretty high. Mm -hmm. um, other more unique barriers to uh, college participation um, include this tension that we mentioned earlier between wanting to pursue higher ed and a career um, that may not be available locally with the desire to remain connected to home and so that is a real tension that we see young people struggling with. Um, another uh, issue is that lots of rural young people have considerable family responsibilities so they may be doing elder care, they may be contributing to a family business um, and, and those things are often impediments as well, at least in the short term. I mean, I think it's important to also acknowledge that um, the path, the direct path from high school graduation to college enrollment doesn't work for everybody, and that some of these young people may elect to go later in their lives. So how do colleges and universities support rural students once they're on campus? Well. First of all, we're fortunate in Indiana. We do have Ivy Tech Community College. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 32 campuses around the state, and there are classes offered, I think, at more than 75, in more than 75 communities around the state, and it is affordable. And so it does mean that in rural Indiana, if you want to go beyond high school, uh, you don't have to drive very far, and the tuition is reasonable, especially if you stay at home. So we're fortunate in that respect. Um, at our campus where I'm located, um, there's a real effort. Freshmen are brought in for an entire week. Uh, and really there's an effort to acclimate students to the campus, but also to let them know here are the kinds of services that are available. Uh, you know, we're a campus of 40,000 and you bring someone in from a, from a high school that only had two or 300, it can be culture shock. and so. There's a lot of attention paid to uh, freshmen, especially on, on our particular campus. Um, the, the other thing that, that happens is that it's, it's not really new, although there's been a new emphasis on that, and that is earning college credits while you're still in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and Ivy Tech again, clear back into the late 80s, has always been real cooperative about yeah. offering dual credit classes, especially within the buildings yes. themselves. Now, <clears throat> dual credit classes from the universities have been more of a challenge uh, because some of the bigger universities have different criteria mm -hmm. for who can teach a class and, and who can't. But at least that's, a, that's been a real plus where, where students can enter that first year of college and, and have several credits uh, and be ahead of the game a little bit. We have partnerships with uh, four universities. Uh, three universities and one college in the state of Indiana. We are a member school of Ivy Tech's early college program. Uh, and we're hopeful that within the next few years, through that program, that students that walk across the stage and get their diploma from me can go to another table uh, at, on stage and receive their associate's degree from, in, from Ivy Tech. We also have uh, partnerships with Indiana University, Purdue University at Columbus. IU and Vincennes, and all of them have been wonderful to work with. I think they really, really know, uh, they want our market, so to speak, and they realize the service that they're providing for our students. And I know this varies on location, but for um, people that might not be as familiar with this concept of dual enrollment, mm -hmm. so you have a student who's enrolled in your high school because they're a high school student. What does it mean for that student if they are also duly enrolled somewhere else at a higher education institution? They are taking the course um, per the college's curriculum uh, and requirements, but when they pass that course uh, and earn that college credit from uh, Ivy Tech, for instance, uh, then we also grant them high school credit for the same course. And then uh, who is teaching the students? Is it your high school staff or is it that your high school staff have been trained by these other um, higher ed institutions? How does that play In most cases, out? it is our staff who have been trained uh, and or also have the academic credentials um, uh, per the requirements of that university to teach that course at the college level. The one exception is our relationship with IUPUC. Um, we have uh, a sociology and a psychology class going on right now that students are participating in that, that Indiana University is sending the professors to us in North Vernon. And it sounds like that those relationships have been established for a long time. Yes, most um, of them, yes. And then uh, there has been I'm trying to think about for um, other districts that might not have local easy access to some of these mm -hmm. higher ed institutions, how to go about this idea and process of dual enrollment, knowing that mm -hmm. it can be very successful for some students in terms of that engagement aspect. Um, does anyone have any ideas of how to help? We just found that we reached out. Ivy Tech reached out to us, but in the case of the other universities, we just reached out to them, and they were very quick to respond uh, and very anxious to serve us once they knew we had an interest for our students. Great. Um, I think we have time for one additional question um, that's focused on consolidation. So um, many rural communities lost their identity and pride when schools consolidated. Would smaller community-based schools better serve rural youth? I've been in both environments. Um, before I came to Jennings County, uh, where we have 1,400 kids in the high school, um, I was at Southwestern uh, Consolidated Schools in Shelby County, where we graduated about 55 kids a year. Uh, it was a very, very small little place. And um, uh, I think that, you know, you can have wonderful schools, whether they're large or small. Um, I enjoyed the small environment, but what I found was that due to, you know, just uh, our sources of revenue and, and uh, the monies and the funds that are provided to us by the state of Indiana to operate on, um, there was a limit to what we could provide those kids. As hard as we worked at doing otherwise, there was a limit as to what we could provide our students in that little tiny high school as opposed to what I can provide for them at, at Jennings County. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the biggest difference. Uh, the quality was no different. Great schools, either one, but it was the resources. In fact, there's some uh, research that suggests that small rural schools are in fact better for impoverished kids. And I'm grinning because a relative of mine has contributed to that research base, but <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a pretty durable finding that um, there is a benefit for poor kids in terms of attending smaller mm -hmm. schools in rural places. Great. 
Did you want to add anything? I, I just think that's the, the power of the collaboratives that I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier that, um, you know, with, with some of the things we can do with technology today, we can collaborate, we can cooperate, different schools and different districts can do those kinds of things, maintain their identity, and yet increase the things that they can do for students. And so, um, you know, communities are important. And so, uh, again, we have to think about maybe how to use our resources uh, in a different way and, and to help each other. Great. And I know we could spend a lot of time going into each one of these conversations and have a full two-hour discussion on each one. But I did want to thank our panelists today for providing these insights into rural dropout prevention challenges and potential solutions, particularly in Indiana's rural communities. Please visit the RHEL Midwest website at relmidwest.org for additional information about our rural and dropout prevention research alliances, our work, and to view the archive of this event, including resources mentioned by the panelists and other supplementary materials. Making Connections, Dropout Prevention in Rural Schools is provided by Regional Educational Laboratory Midwest through funds provided by the Institute of Education Sciences.